I'm a huge fan. I met him, I don't know, over 30 years ago, Jack McManus with the Birch Society. He joins us this morning. Thank you, sir. Good morning, and welcome back to Denver. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Good to be with you again. Yeah, if you get just a quick bio of yourself so people get a sense of you, and then a little bit about the Birchers, and let's start to talk about 9-11 and the wars that are taking place. Well, I was born and raised in Brooklyn, New York. I ended up at Holy Cross College in Massachusetts, got a degree, uh, took a uh, commission in the United States Marine Corps, served three years, uh, started a career as an electronics engineer in 1960, and in 1966 I gave it up and joined the staff of the Birch Society. Uh, I've served as the public relations director for many years, and since 1991 I've been president. What was the what was the defining or the, perhaps the seminal moment that made you come into your thought process that you have today? Probably my father. Uh, 1945, I was 10 years old. I was studying geography in the grade school I went to there in Brooklyn. And I said to my dad, how come if the Russians are our allies fighting the Nazis, they're not fighting the Japs? They have a border facing Japan. And my father said to me, that's a very good question. The answer is they're no good. The next war is with them, and you'll be in it. And you want to have an impact on a 10-year-old, that's a pretty good way of doing it. My father was an anti-communist. Uh, I, I was an anti-communist right from day one, I guess. And uh, my father was also a big supporter of Joe McCarthy. Mm-hmm. I can remember him pounding the kitchen table with his fist, saying, I know he's right, he's right, I know he's right, and look what they're doing to him, this is terrible. Uh, my dad's opinion about that has certainly been vindicated by a great book that was published recently called Blacklisted by History. It's a story of the Joe McCarthy era and all of the charges that Joe McCarthy made that have been proved true. So, you, you and I have a really opposing view on the Japanese and the Russians and certainly an opposing view on Joe McCarthy. We have had this out before. I don't want to eat up our time with it, but if you want to, I'm willing. But um, what, I'm, what I'm more – well, anyhow, I didn't mean to interrupt. If you would continue. I'm sorry, Jack. Well, <clears throat> then, then uh, in the 1960s, early 60s, the John Birch Society was a headline all over the place. And uh, – I waited. I was a big fan of William Buckley at the time. Mm-hmm. I was reading his magazine. I uh, can remember saying to myself, well, what's Buckley think about this Birch Society? And nothing happened for a whole year. And then finally he came out with a six-page editorial saying, in effect, that uh, there's a lot of good people in the Birch Society, but they ought to get rid of that screwball Robert Welsh that's running it. Yeah. And I subscribed to that view. I didn't know anything about Welsh. So I wrote him a letter and thanked him for it. And lo and behold, they published my letter in the magazine in the next issue. And because they did, a fellow looked me up and wrote me a letter who was in the Birch Society. And he, and he said, are you basing your attitude about Robert Welsh regarding what he said or what others have said of him? I thought that was a pretty good question, so I wrote back to the guy and said, if you got something you think I ought to see, I'll be glad to take a look at it. And my intention was to show him how stupid he was. But what he sent me really impressed me, and I said to myself, maybe I got this thing all wrong. So I started doing some heavy digging, and I ended up joining the Birch Society. And then I started chronicling William Buckley, and I, I wrote a book that's a oh, good 10 or 15 years old now. A book about William Buckley. Yeah, Buckley's, in, Buckley's a really interesting man. Really yeah. is. Yeah. Uh, my book on Buckley calls him the Pied Piper for the establishment. Yeah. yeah. Whenever they needed somebody, somebody from the so-called right to come ahead mm-hmm. and, and back what they were doing or what they were saying, Buckley was their man. And, yeah. and he did it over and over and over again. You know, he, he was influenced by Whitaker Chambers. Uh, I've read so much about Buckley. I obviously, No, he, he was... He was he was the guy that put the cap on Willie Chambers. No, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, I uh, I, I um you know that 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 time period is so. I mean, I I read in that 
in, in that cauldron, if you would, where there's a relationship between Joseph P. Kennedy, the ambassador, and Joseph McCarthy, the senator, including using Bobby Kennedy as a, um, he's a witch hunter. You know, Bobby Kennedy joins and they, they finance, they finance in Joe McCarthy. And I mean, it's, there's a really interesting relationship. And according to a book I just finished on Jackie Kennedy, that Joe McCarthy was actually dating one of the um, Kennedy daughters. Correct. And he's the godfather of Robert Kennedy's oldest son. He's got, he's Robert. I mean, people think about the Kennedy, about Joe McCarthy and the Cold War, and think about the Kennedys, especially Bobby, and it was anything but. Bobby Kennedy joined that staff, along with uh, Roy Cohn and those guys, and they were what people dubbed the witch hunters, but Bobby Kennedy was right in the middle of all of that. Yeah, well, the Kennedys were, were backers of Joe McCarthy. Absolutely, well, yeah, to, uh, yeah, big time. Who's going to Florida? Foot. Went to Florida. Yeah, was, Went to Florida with him. Yeah, he played uh, He played the, the touch football games on the front lawn. That's and, right. Massachusetts. And which As one? Say, which one of the daughters was it? Eunice or one of them he dated? Was I'm gonna, not sure. Was going to marry? Know her. Was one of them? I'm gonna, not sure. Which. Was going to marry her? And um, and oh, it, it was there. And uh, actually, in that time period, according to this recent book that I've read, I was on Jackie Kennedy that Joe uh, Joe Kennedy, Richard Nixon meets jo- uh, Richard Richard Nixon meets Jack Kennedy in Congress, and Joseph P. Kennedy sends money. Out to Richard Nixon at the time he's locked in that fight with Helen Gahagan Douglas, and uh, one of his principal funders in the race is Joseph P. Kennedy, the ambassador. He was all over the lot. He yeah. did some good things and he did some very bad oh, things. Oh, amazing guy! I mean, just I mean, he's a he creep yeah. he creep I and mean, he's just you know, I, for another morning for another morning. Let me come back to. It's been 13 years tomorrow since the nation was attacked. What do you think? Number one was behind the attack. And now some 13 years later, and I know that you've waded through Dick Cheney and George Bush. Let's just take them on first. So let's initially take us back. 13th anniversary of 9-11 is upon us. Why did that happen? It happened to send a signal to the United States that you're, you're, you're not protected, you're not uh, invincible, uh, we can get you, and so on. Uh, militant Islam was d- demonstrated at that point that it had clout, and the clout that it has is certainly being demonstrated today in uh, Africa, in Middle East, uh, all over the place. And uh, it's it's a scourge that has to be faced, it has to be discussed, it has to be talked about. Uh what are there, a million, a billion and a half Muslims in the world? If only 1% of them are militant enough to carry out that, that's still a big number. Mm-hmm. And that's what we seem to be facing. You've got the Boko Haram in Nigeria. You've got the uh, ISIS in, in Syria. The Brotherhood. You, you get on a list of people. Hamas, Blacks of... Right, and Russia you've got, and even in India now, the, the of course. Muslims making, well, that's making been a, noise. That's been a huge fight. I mean, if when people under, they history really covers up for Mahatma Gandhi, but the war between Hindus and Muslims when uh, independence comes, I mean, how many people died and still die because they declare war on each other in India? They certainly do it in Pakistan. Um, the, wars be, the wars on the Hindus are horrible. And in the, the, Hindu wars, they stop trains and kill everybody on the train. Yeah, and they've done that recently. Yeah. Uh, ISIS has done that in, in uh, Syria and in Iraq. Let me ask you this. Jack McManus from the Birchers with a 710K and U.S. Peter Boyles. Why did George Bush invade Iraq? He invaded Iraq because Cheney and Rumsfeld were really running the show, and they wanted to build an American empire. They wanted the United States to be uh, the leader of an empire throughout the world. I agree. They said that in their project for the new American century, and they're still at it. I totally it, agree. I've been reading. They, 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 they had, they had maps, there. Jack. They had the maps of who was going to get what oil fields. Right. They get, there's an article today in the, in the New York Times, Cheney urges House GOP sure. to abandon isolationism. Yep, absolutely. Yeah, that, that, well, so Cheney's still at it. Now, 
<clears throat> and I go on a lot of radio shows, not just yours. Yeah. And uh, I'm asked all the time, well, is the John Birch Society isolationist? I said, no, we're not isolationists. We're non-interventionists with your son, True. your daughter, and your wallet. Thank you. And that makes big sense with a lot of people. Yep. Uh, there are some of these people that think the United States should rule the world. My attitude is the United States should come back and, and mind its own business. Thank you. Show the rest of the world that there's a better way of doing things and have people adopt Thank you. real Americanism, not, yep. not phony stuff that's being paraded you, for us today. I don't know if we've ever talked about this, but do you see the change in American foreign policy with the rise of the multinational corporations? Yes, to a degree, but... Mostly the change in the United States' attitude toward foreign policy is the work of the Council on Foreign Relations. And that goes back to Woodrow Wilson. That goes back to uh, Wilson and House. House yeah. was uh, the <clears throat> the puppeteer, and, and Wilson was the puppet all during the Wilson administration. If the U.S. would have stayed out of the First World War, which, in fact, you look at it today, that would have been a gift, how would the world have ended differently, or what would, would have been different? Because the U.S. really does change... Um, everything about what's taking place in Europe? Well, if the United States had stayed out of the war, which it certainly should have, it would have been stronger. It would have been a, 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 a country that would be more respected. Uh, there certainly were problems in Europe. Uh, world War I should never have started, uh, involving all those nations and, and so forth, because one man got killed. Well, mm -hmm. We can, we can regret the fact that he got killed, but don't start a world war over it. What's interesting yeah. is out of that comes the creation of states that don't exist, and that, of course, leads us to 9-11. That, you know, they're, you know, these are phony countries. These countries don't exist. They were created by French, British, American interests. Um, God only knows about what was taking place in the Soviet Union. But the French and the British in particular are given back countries they had no business owning in the first place and defined those countries in the first place. That leads to this, doesn't it? Yes, it does. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there was no such country as Iraq. No. Uh, and, and look so, what happened there. Well, there, it was called Mesopotamia. Right. You know, one of the points I like to make is, here you've got Iraq, and, and we supposedly liberated Iraq. Mm -hmm. We got rid of Saddam Hussein. There were a, a million and a half Christians in Iraq. And did very well, by the way, under Saddam, did they not? Right. Working working side by side with, with uh, Arabs and Muslims and, and, and so on, and, and in, in perfect harmony, perfect peace, they had a good deal going on. Saddam was Saddam. The idea that George Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Wolfowitz and company said, number one, they said there were terrorist training camps in Iraq. There were not. They there said, were not. There, there were weapons of mass destruction. There, there were not. No, there were not. There was a relationship between Saddam and Osama. They hated each other. In fact, the the body count from the time Saddam in the coup takes place up until when he is executed, that his secret police probably liquidated, if they say, got rid of twenty to 30,000 jihadis. They would find them. They would kill them. They did not want them in their country. They hated Saddam. Saddam's on the hate list of um, of Osama bin Laden. The U.S. media and, of course, the Bush administration, Cheney and company, they absolutely lied. I fell for the lie early on. But it's amazing what the truth will do to your ideology, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, go back to <clears throat> Cheney. Wolfowitz, Rumsfeld, all of these guys, they're all members of this Council on Foreign Relations. Yes, they are. 